Welcome back Highlanders to the beginning of chapter 7 on natural resource management and we'll be focusing here on renewable resources. So we've conquered the environmental policy uh, base camp here in our climb up the environmental economics mountain and that was a pretty tough one that was probably the most mathematically intense of all the sections. Right this next uh, chapter here chapter 7 is going to start out a little graphically intense Right, but then it's going to kind of ease up and then chapter eight is mostly just fun stuff about how to grow your own organic fruits and vegetables should you desire to do so. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and continue our climb here by going over chapter seven. So in this particular chapter, we are going to be focusing on, again, natural resource management. And um, with that in mind, here is the overview for this particular chapter. So we'll first talk about the definition for and characteristics of fisheries, then we'll talk about this uh, uh, definition of carrying capacity, what that means, what uh, maximum sustainable yield means, and then we're going to graph out fisheries, which are going to be the um, uh, biggest part of this particular lecture video, and talk about how uh, firm behavior uh, operates within the fishing industry to maximize profits. Right. And then our next lecture video, we're going to talk about how to decide whether to harvest a tree, the myths and truths of clear cutting, and how to engage in proper forest management. So what are the difference between clear cutting, shelter wood cutting, and high grading? And what should you should do uh, should you happen to have a uh, timber stands in your yard? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the forest management profession. So that's kind of where we're headed with this particular uh, chapter. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into this discussion on renewable resources. So a renewable resource, as we talked about in Chapter 2, is just a natural resource which replenishes either through biological reproduction or any other naturally reoccurring process. And it uh, replenishes in a finite amount of time relative to the human time scale, right? So it replenishes within a rate of, uh, or within a time that we as human beings, right, would call replenishable. Again, there are some things like uh, uh, natural gas deposits that do replenish, but over like millions of years, Right, so it's not something that uh, we consider uh, renewable within our limited uh, human uh, time frame. So one example of a renewable resource would be like fisheries. So a fishery is kind of, a, it could be uh, something that exists out in the wild or it could be something that exists within a farm or in this case, a university. So I was down in uh, Puerto Maldonado, Peru, down in near the uh, Amazon part of Peru and taking a look at uh, kind of their uh, fisheries that exist within that university. So here's kind of the process for how fish are grown. And what they do is they start out growing them in these little tubs. And then when they get big enough, release them into these much bigger, uh, more uh, uh, wildlife-like environments. And then they kind of harvest fish as they need them from there. So again, this is an example of a fishery. Right? It's one that is, again, uh, where uh, fish are farm raised right here at this local university. Uh, with that in mind, a fishery is any entity engaged in raising or harvesting fish and so a fishery, again, may involve capturing fish out in the wild, right? This usually involves doing so in uh, an environment that uh, may or may not be protected, but often from a protected site, or uh, raising fish through farm, uh, fish farming or aquaculture. So if you're ever wondering what the difference was between, say, wild-caught and farm-raised salmon, right, these pictures can probably help explain it. If it's happening out here in the ocean, it's wild-caught. If they're raised here on the farm, Right, that's why again what we call aquaculture or farm raised. Right, so with that in mind, those are kind of the uh, two ways in which uh, we can define these uh, fisheries. Right, again, it could exist out in the wild or within a more controlled setting. Right, now some important characteristics of fishing in a protected environment or kind of out there in that wild is that one, anyone can fish, so anybody with nets or a rod can go out there and start catching fish. Right, so we can kind of look at this industry as non-excludable meaning that uh, these fish are kind of like a common property resource that we talked about back in chapter four. But at the same time, these fish can replenish, making them a uh, uh, not only just a common re resource, but a common renewable resource, right? So while it's true that uh, they're not excludable and people can go out there and uh, uh, just take as much fish as they can, it's also true that these fish can replenish, right? Which uh, might help us avoid some of those tragedy of the commons problems so long as we can allow these fish to replenish at a rate that, um, uh, again, allows them to exist into the future, which is what we're going to be talking about within this class. All right. So when it comes down to fisheries, an important definition is called carrying capacity. And this is the maximum population size of a species that the environment can sustain indefinitely 
given the food, habitat, water, and other necess uh, necessities available in the environment. So the carrying capacity of a fishery is essentially the most fish that that particular area can support, right, uh, before those fish start dying off due to a lack of resources. And then maximum sustainable yield is the most of a renewable resource that can be removed every period indefinitely. So, for example, it's the most fish that can be uh, uh, caught while still allowing those fish to renew uh, to a point where um, it's what we call sustainable. So, again, it's not limiting the amount that, of fish that we can catch in the future. So, again, it's just the most of a renewable resource that can be removed every period indefinitely for every period so that it doesn't reduce our ability to remove fish or anything else in the future, right? So again, that's what we call maximum sustainable yield. Right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and graph out these uh, uh, fish populations looking at uh, different growth rates. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go ahead and draw this graph. So, Starting out looking something like this. In your notes, we're going to do two graphs right on top of one another. So if you're following along in your notes, make sure you're leaving room to do that. So on this top graph here, we're going to be looking at the population of fish. And then here on the x-axis, we're going to look at that population and how that moves across time. All right, and then on the graph below it, we're looking at the growth rate of said population. Relative to the uh, population itself. All right, so as these fish start to grow, right, you're going to start off with very low levels of fish. They're going to increase, and then that growth rate is going to get a lot higher, and then that growth rate is also going to eventually start tampering out. All right, so if we're going to uh, divide this kind of uh, population growth rate line into different areas here, right? Um, so let's say that this represents a low level of fish. Well, this low level of fish is going to have low growth rates because when you have a low level of fi uh, fish, there's plenty of uh, space and there's plenty of food available for those fish. But with low levels, there's not a lot of potential mates available for those fish, right? So low levels of fish, you're going to have a relatively low growth rate. And then the next thing I want to talk about is what happens if we have, say, a uh, medium level of fish. Let's do that one in blue. Maybe up here somewhere. This right here represents our medium range of fish. And this is where you're going to have the highest growth rates. And the reason why is because when you have a medium level of fish, all right, you're going to have still plenty of food and space available for those fish. And now they've got plenty of potential mates, which are going to be available for them to reproduce. And finally, from here on out, we're going to have a high level of fish. And when you have high levels of fish, the growth rate is going to be low again because the food in space is now becoming scarce. There are, of course, potential mates that are uh, uh, there to reproduce with, but also with big schools of fish, they tend to be easier prey for predators. So between having a lack of food in space as well as being easy prey for predators, these growth rates are going to be low again. Right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk about what that uh, growth rate is going to look like. Right. So you're going to have a growth rate for the fish population looking something like this. Well, that growth rate is going to keep on growing up to a certain point. And then it's going to start to go down again. Right again, as those uh, as that food and space become scarce and the space become uh, uh, as that food and growth become scarce and as that prey starts to uh, as it become easier prey for predators. Right, you're going to see that growth rate start to go down. Right, so again, we're going to keep on increasing our growth rate till we get to that maximum, and then it's going to start decreasing again. Right, so that's uh, likely what you're going to see with regards to a normal growth rate for the fish population. All right, so let's go ahead and go through a realistic population function for fish. I'm going to go ahead and exit the uh, full screen mode here so we can 
use uh, some different colors a little bit more easily. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and graph this out. So let's say that this is going to, again, be measuring our growth rate. on the vertical axis and here on the horizontal axis we're going to measure population although we're going to put the line here because it is possible for growth rates to be negative where again we're just losing fish rather than increasing those numbers okay so again this represents a growth rate that is zero so of course you can have positive growth rates and you can have negative growth rates as well right and so you might see a uh, population uh, function for fish looking something like this, where it starts out negative, and then gets positive, and goes back down here. All right. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and label these points here. So we're going to go ahead and label this point here point U, and we're going to label this point here point S. All right. Now, where the growth rate is um, uh, zero, right, that's where you're going to have what is known as an equilibrium, right? At a zero growth rate, there's not a tendency for that population to get bigger or smaller, right? However, we have two different kinds of equilibrium here. Point U represents what we call an unstable equilibrium. Again, point U is an unstable equilibrium equilibrium, hence why we call it point U. And here's what I mean by an unstable equilibrium is that if you are at point U, then you are not going to be moving anywhere, right? So that's why we call it an equilibrium. The reason why we call it unstable is because as soon as you deviate from point U, then there's a tendency to move away from it, right? So in other words, anywhere near point U, there is a tendency to move away from point U. Right, so again, if this line uh, is representing our negative growth rate here, right, then if the growth rate is um, less than that, uh, if the growth rate is negative here, right then anything less than point u and we're going to be moving this way along our uh, population uh, curve or our population axis right in other words if our growth rate is negative our population is getting smaller right now anything above uh, point u in terms of the number of uh, fish then you're going to see that growth rate being positive so the population is going to be moving uh, this way along that curve Right, so in other words, again, we're going away from point U, not towards point U, right? That's what makes it an unstable equilibrium, right? So again, if we are at point U, we're not going to go anywhere, but as soon as we get a little bit less than point U, right, then we'll be moving towards zero population or extinction, right? If we're moving away from uh, point U, then that fish population, or sorry, for a little bit above uh, point U, then that fish population is going to get uh, uh, bigger, but either way, right, if we're uh, around point U but not exactly equal to it, you're moving away from that point. Now, it is important that we do keep the fish population above point U because, again, anything below point U gives us a negative growth rate that's going to move us towards zero fish, and that's what we call extinction. So we do need to keep the species Uh, above a uh, pass or above this point we'll say past this point to avoid extinction in other words once we go below that point u there in terms of our population size with that negative growth rate and this population function that is game over right our fish are going to go extinct right now point s is what we call a stable equilibrium And the reason why we call it stable equilibrium is because there's a tendency to move towards point S. 
right? So again, imagine there at point S we have uh, zero uh, population growth, right? So again, you're going to stay at point S. Well, for anything slightly below point S, there's going to be a tendency to move back towards point S because anything slightly below point S, we still have a positive population growth rate. So it's going to move us to the right along that X axis until we get to point S. Now, if we are somewhere above point S, we now have a negative population growth rate. That's going to move us back towards point S, right? So again, instead of going away from that point, we're going towards that point. That's what makes that a stable equilibrium. So there's a tendency, again, to move toward point S rather than away from the point like we were doing with point U, right? And point S, therefore, is the most that is going to be uh, uh, kind of consistently within that particular fishery. In other words, this point S here is what represents our carrying capacity. All right, so again, point S represents our kind of carrying capacity for fish. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and go through another graph here. What happens to our fish population as we start to remove fish over time using the idea of this graph? So let's go ahead and draw out our, uh, our fish population graph one more time. At least one more time for now. All right, so we got growth rate up here. And again, we got a uh, total population down here. And you might see our growth function looking again, something like this, like we've shown in the past. We at this point here representing our carrying capacity. And the most fish that this particular part of the environment can sustain. All right. So let's go ahead and use some different colors here and talk about um, this idea of a removal rate. So we'll call this R1. Let's say R1 represents the rate at which we remove fish from our population. Right. So again, R1 is just going to represent our removal rate here. Okay. And now we're going to go ahead and talk about what these different points on this uh, growth rate population, or sorry, this growth rate function represent. So let's go ahead and call this point here, uh, we'll call it G1. G1 represents the growth rate of fish at this point. So G1 is how much the fish are growing. R1 is how much the fish are, fish are removing. How much fish we are removing, I should say. And this right here, we'll call this S1. That represents the fish stock, or again, the amount of fish that we have. So let's say that our fish stock starts out here at 10. All right. Now, the difference between G1 and R1 is I1, right? And I1 is just going to be our increase in the amount of fish. So G1 represents our growth rate. And I1 represents our increase in fish stock. So as you can see, if the growth rate is higher than the removal rate, then that's going to represent an increase in fish stock. However, having said that, if the removal rate would be higher than the growth rate, then that might represent a decrease in fish stock. Right, so moving forward here, this I1 is going to be equal to G1 minus R1. Right, and this is going to be the increase in fish stock at S1. The increase in our population of uh, fish here when we have, say, 10 fish in the uh, environment. Now, as you notice, if we go up this curve a little bit, we're going to call this G2. 
Notice that these higher growth weights, keeping a constant removal rate, you're going to have an even higher increase in fish stock. All right, so call that I2. All right, let's say that happens when we have this many fish, S2, in the water. We'll say that's a total of, say, 20. All right, so here at I2, that is equal to G2 minus R1 there. Or again, our growth rate minus our removal rate. This is going to be the increase in fish stock. S2 and so forth and so on right so S2 is just going to be equal to S1 plus I1 so we know that S1 is 10 fish and S2 is 20 then that increase or I1 must be equal to 10 right and S3 wherever that will be is going to be equal to our S2 plus I2 Right. So let's say that uh, S3 happens up here at the very peak. If that S3 number were to be equal to 50, then that must mean that I2 is equal to 30. And again, if we're operating here, we'll call this I3. That's going to be the increase in fish at this growth rate. Up here, G3, again, assuming that our removal rate is constant. All right, so with that in mind, you can kind of see how this uh, graph develops. Um, now, if R is equal to G, or if the removal rate is equal to the growth rate, then what do you think I will be then? You get zero, you got it right, right? There's not going to be any increase in our fish stock if we're removing as many as are growing. You're going to keep the fish population the same. So our fish population won't change. All right. So with that in mind, it should be kind of uh, clear to see, uh, again, how this graph works. All right, just to make sure we got it, All right, let's go ahead and say that we're going to extend this growth rate G2 over. We'll call that S4. Now, if I ask you to estimate what do you think S4 would be, right, well, remember that S4 is going to be equal to S3 plus I3. Now, I don't give you a number for I3, but we do know that it is bigger than I2, and I2 is equal to 30, right? So we might say something like 40 here. I mean, the S4 is equal to 90. So with that in mind, if I were to, say, call this point here S5, I'm going to ask you, how many fish do we have here at S5, or what is our population or fish stock there at S5? And when you are trying to figure that out, you got to remember that this um, I2 is going to be equal to I4. So those two increases in fish stock should be the same. Now, we know that I2 is equal to 30. That means that I4 must also be equal to 30, and that means that our fish stock here must be equal to 120. All right, so you can be able to read that graph and work through numbers like that should I give you a problem like this on, uh, on the exam, right? But those are the kinds of uh, problems I might give you, and that's kind of how you want to read this uh, fishery graph. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on. So, again, we're going to go ahead and show you another uh, uh, graph here. Now, what the maximum fish stock is 1,000. And these fish could reproduce 2,000 new fish. So if you have 1,000 in your fish stock, then 2,000 would be that increase, right? Uh, and if we can remove those 2,000, then we'd be right back at the original 1,000. So what might that look like on this particular graph? So again, we're going to be looking at growth rate here. And we're looking at that growth rate on the vertical axis, but population here on the uh, horizontal axis. 
And again, you're going to have a function that might look something like this. All right. So again, I want you to imagine a maximum fish stock of, say, uh, 1,000. So we'll call this X ma S max is equal to 1,000. Now, the population of fish could be bigger than that, right? But if we were to remove, say, um, the most fish possible here, right here, so this is going to be our R max. If that was our removal rate, notice that our removal rate is equal to our growth rate, which in this case is G max. And that is right here at 2,000. So what we're saying here is that at a stock of fish equal to 1,000, right, those 1,000 fish can reproduce uh, or create 2,000 fish, right? But if we remove those 2,000 fish, then we're going to be right back at 1,000. Now, that's not a bad thing because that 1,000 can then remove, can then create another 2,000 fish that we can remove another 2,000 fish. And again, we're going to be right back at that 1,000 again. So as long as we're not removing more than 2,000 fish, and as long as our removal rate is equal to our growth rate, then we're going to have the same number of fish that we had before. And we can do that indefinitely, right? So in this case, our max is what we call our maximum sustainable yield. Remember, that's the most that we can remove indefinitely throughout time. So can we call our max here our maximum sustainable yield and again that kind of represents the uh, most fish that we can remove while leaving enough to replenish so that we can remove that exact same number next year right and still keep that same amount of fish around so our max there which is at the peak of that growth rate assures the uh, highest growth rate growth rate while still removing our max every period and again that's what makes it that maximum sustainable yield is that this doesn't uh, reduce our ability to remove fish into the future so as long as your removal rate is equal to your growth rate, then you're going to have the same number of fish uh, able to reproduce again in the uh, 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 next period. Now, I do, want to keep, I do want you to keep in mind that we are taking 2,000 fish out of the water here, right? And we had a growth rate of 2,000 fish. That doesn't mean that the original 1,000 fish are still the original 1,000 fish, right? So if you have 1,000 mama and papa fishes, and they give birth to 2,000 baby fishes, the amount you're going to take out is probably going to be a combination of those mama and papas and those babies. I'm not saying that we're only taking out the babies, so it's these same fish that are keep on reproducing every year, right? So you're going to have 1,000 fish reproduce every year. They might be completely different fish, though, from what was there the year before, given that we are taking 2,000 out every year. All right, so keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and continue on and start applying some of this to the idea of maximizing profits or profit motives. All right, so what is the optimal size of the fish stock population? Right, we must compare the cost of removing fish with the revenue we get from our catch, right? So with that in mind, total revenue, as uh, we've talked about before, is equal to price times quantity. In this case, the quantity of fish caught. And assuming that every fish has the same selling price, we can map that directly to the growth rate. In other words, our growth rate curve is going to be equal to our total revenue curve. Again, assuming that each fish has the same selling price. And then the total cost of uh, uh, this uh, uh, endeavor or catching fish is the effort per unit of fish caught times the number of fish that we catch or uh, harvest if, again, we're putting them or if we're growing them up on a farm. Right. So, again, uh, effort per unit of fish times the number of fish. And, again, we might, uh, to make things easy, just assume that that effort is the same for each fish. All right. So, with that in mind... Right, let's go ahead and graph this out. All right, so once again, we got growth rate. If we're talking about fish, or dollars if we're talking about total revenue, that should be an equal sign there. Right. And then over here, we've got the population. So again, you might have a growth function looking something like this. 
Same one that we've been studying all along. And again, um, this uh, uh, growth rate is going to be exactly equal to our total revenue curve. So, so the growth rate and the total revenue are the same. If again, we assume that each fish has the same selling price, right? After all, every new fish is a new opportunity to convert that fish into dollars, right? And um, if each fish has the same selling price, then that growth rate of fish is going to be equal to our total revenue. Now, our total cost is the amount of effort per fish times the amount of fish har uh, harvested. And that's going to be a linear curve. And what I mean by that is, let's go through an example here. If, let's say that uh, the effort per fish is $5. Then the, um, the total cost is going to be equal to that effort, which I'm just going to abbreviate here as E, times the quantity of fish that we are uh, pulling out. So if QE is equal to 5, then our total cost is going to be equal to 25. However, if our Q is equal to 10, then our total cost is going to be equal to 50. If Q is equal to 20, then our total cost is going to be equal to uh, 100, right, and so forth and so on. So the idea is that this total cost is going to be a very linear curve that slopes up, looking something like that. Then that's a straight line if you can. And then where those two intersect, total cost and total revenue, that is where our economic profit is equal to zero, right? So here if we had this level of fish, our economic profit is zero. Remember that this economic profit is equal to total revenue minus total cost. Again, if total revenue is equal to total cost, say they're both equal to, say, 50, then your economic profit is zero. Your zero economic profit does not mean a business is failing, right? It simply means that it's making as much money there as it could anywhere else, right? Now, this is where total cost equals total revenue is where, again, the economic profit is zero, where we're reaching this long-run equilibrium in the market. However, that's not necessarily where a firm maximizes profit, right? Uh, we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. But for now, again, if this represents our total revenue curve, and this represents our total cost curve, then everywhere between zero and that point there, right, you're going to be making positive economic profits. Right. Anywhere beyond that point, notice that total cost is now greater than total revenue, you're going to be making economic losses. All right, so again, this is kind of how we're going to start to map these uh, fisheries towards this idea of maximizing profits in a competitive market. All right, so again, our uh, growth rate curve represents total revenue. That linear uh, uh, upward sloping line there represents total cost. As long as total revenue is greater than total cost, right, then firms are going to keep on jumping into the market and producing, right, all the way till they get to this long run equilibrium where our uh, economic profit is equal to zero. And this is the amount of fish stock we're going to have at that long run equilibrium, right? Now, again, anywhere beyond this uh, uh, point, you're going to see a situation where total cost is greater than total revenues. And those are uh, when firms will be making economic losses. And then firms are going to leave that market until, again, we're back to this point, long run equilibrium where we're making this zero economic profit. Hopefully you remember that when we went over that microeconomic review back in Chapter 3. We're kind of bringing it full circle with this whole uh, fishery market idea. So let's talk a little bit about profit maximization here. So remember we talked about this way back in that microeconomic review chapter, uh, chapter three. Uh, so if we want to maximize profits, which is just total revenue minus total cost, then remember there's a rule that we follow. So hopefully you remember what that profit maximizing rule is. All right, by going back to chapter three, but if you can't, then remember it's where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. 
right? The revenue you get from each fish you pull out of the uh, uh, water has to be equal to the marginal cost or the effort of pulling that fish out of the water if you're maximizing profit. Because anytime the revenue you get for pulling that fish out exceeds the effort or cost of pulling that fish out, then you want to continue to pull fish out. Right, but if the cost or effort exceeds the revenue, then you want to pull less fish out. So you want to be at that point where they are equal. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and go back to that uh, previous graph that we were just looking at. So looking at this graph, we know that this is the point where profits equal to uh, zero, right? So that's where the industry is going to be in long run equilibrium. But as far as the decision of an individual uh, fisher person is concerned, right, they again want to produce at a point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Right now, the marginal revenue curve is going to be essentially, uh, or the marginal revenue is going to be equal to the slope of the total revenue curve because it's just a derivative of total revenue with respect to quantity. And the marginal cost is going to be the uh, slope of the total cost curve, right? Because again, it's just the derivative of total cost with respect to quantity. So if we draw a tangent line that is parallel to our total cost curve, Maybe looking something like this, where again just touches or barely connects to our total revenue curve. This tangent line here represents a line where the uh, where this slope is equal to our total cost curve slope, and wherever that touches our total revenue curve, right, that is where our marginal revenue equals our marginal cost, or that's our S star, if you will, of fish stock. The amount of fish stock that will maximize our profit, right? So with that in mind, you're going to look for a point again where the tangent line is parallel to the total cost curve and just touching that total revenue curve. Notice that's not quite happening there at that particular peak, right? But where marginal revenue enters is equal to marginal cost, right? That is what's going to represent the point that maximizes profits, right? So that's our profit maximization rule. Don't ever forget it. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and show you a graph about how all this stuff kind of maps together. Now, I'm not going to expect you to draw this graph on an exam, right? I just want you to be able to interpret what these points on this fishery graph represent, right? So here's the graph that we're going to uh, be looking at. I'm going to exit the uh, full screen mode so we can use some different colors here to analyze this graph, right? So again, if we're looking at this uh, top graph here is representing our fish market. Whereas our uh, bottom graph there is kind of representing a firm's um, uh, profits, uh, sorry, their total revenues, total costs, and whether or, not they're, whether or not they're making a profit or a loss, right? So I want you to imagine a uh, first boat getting out there on the water. So this is our first boat, right? Um, it's going to be easier if I just draw a boat under here. This is our first boat getting out there on the water, right? Now, the first boat, according to this graph, has a marginal cost right here of getting out on the water. And then they have a marginal revenue, as represented by this curve here, of getting out on the water. So notice that the marginal revenue outweighs the marginal cost for that first boat. And the same thing is true for our second boat. So if our second boat gets out on the water to catch fish, Again, this represents the marginal cost. This represents the marginal revenue, right? The revenue outweighs the cost. That second boat's going to get on the water. And that's going to be true all the way up until uh, E star here, where our marginal revenue intersects our marginal cost. We'll say there's maybe 10 boats out on the water then, right? And again, if you follow this up, that E star is occurring, again, where the tangent line uh, to our total revenue curve is parallel to our total cost curve, right? So in other words, R star, which represents our removal rate here, is the removal rate that maximizes profit. All right, and we can actually figure out how much profit is in this particular market um, at that particular uh, removal rate, right? So again, if uh, this curve represents our uh, average total revenue right here, where the average total revenue 
is multiplied by quantity, that's going to be the uh, total revenue in the market at this point in time, or for this firm in the market at this point in time. So this right here represents our total revenue. Right. Our total cost is just our uh, cost per unit times the number of units. So again, it's this area down here. This is our cost per unit given by our marginal uh, cost curve, which is this flat line here, which is also equal to our average total cost. So average total cost times the number of units gives us total cost. Right. And then this amount left over, these are the positive economic profits that this uh, particular firm here is uh, making, right? Or that these fishermen are making in this industry, right? So that is, again, the uh, removal rate that maximizes profit, right? E star is the level of effort, if you will, that maximizes profit. However, again, that's not necessarily the uh, amount that represents the maximum sustainable yield, right? Remember that maximum sustainable yield is the most that you can pull out, right, while still leaving the same amount of fish into the future, and that's going to be our max, right? So our max up there at the top of the curve there, that's going to be your maximum sustainable yield. Didn't mean to uh, move forward there yet. All right, so if I were to ask you on the exam, which removal rate re is the removal rate that's going to maximize profit, you'd say R star. If I were to ask you which removal rate uh, gives us the maximum sustainable yield, you would say R max, right? Now, there is a, uh, another um, uh, rate here, or another, there's another point here, we'll call this E profit equal to zero, right? And that's where the total cost curve and the total revenue curve intersect. So where these two curves, total cost, I'm going to do that in purple. So yeah, total cost and total revenue, where those two curves intersect, right? That is where we're going to have zero economic profit. So if I were to ask you which level of effort uh, gives us uh, our long run equilibrium, right? That is this level here. E profit equals zero, right, represents long run equilibrium in the fish market. Because remember, if you if there are fishermen out there making positive economic profits, new firms are going to continue to jump into the industry, right, until they get to a point where that economic profit is equal to zero. Right. So in other words, there's going to be an incentive for firms to keep on jumping into this industry or fishermen to keep on going out onto the water until they get to a point where the economic profit is equal to zero, right? And so again, that happens where total cost intersects total revenue. So again, at total cost intersecting total revenue, that's where you get the level of effort that's gonna give us our long run equilibrium or in profits equal to zero, right? Our removal rates that maximize profit or effort that maximizes profit, right? That happens where our marginal revenue is equal to our marginal cost. Or again, the tangent line that just touches that total revenue curve is parallel to our total cost curve. All right, so again, that's kind of how you interpret this uh, fishery graph, right? Again, I'm not gonna ask you um, to draw this out or too much detail about this on the test, right? Again, the only thing I might ask you looking at that top portion of this, uh, or that top graph, is again, what's the removal rate that maximizes profit? What is the removal rate that gives us the maximum sustainable yield? And then again, what is the level of effort that results in maybe a uh, long run equilibrium, right? So those are the kinds of questions I might ask you if I ask you any on the uh, test there. All right. So again, each boat will have an individual incentive to enter the market so long as they do receive positive economic profits for them. In the same way that we talked about in Chapter 3, if firms are making economic profits, there's an incentive for uh, new firms to jump into the market and compete away those economic profits down to zero. Uh, 
Same thing if there are fishermen out in the water making positive economic profits, there's incentive for new boats to go out on that water, right? And this will lead to lower economic profits for the fishing industry and less profit per boat. And again, when it comes down to making these decisions, an individual fishing boat doesn't really care about the industry. They care more about themselves. And if they think they can get a piece of that positive economic profit, then they'll continue to jump into the game, even if that means driving down the economic profit for all the boats are already out in the water, right? So, of course, what do you think the long-run economic profit will be in the fishing industry? What's what the long-run economic profit is in any industry, right? It's equal to zero. I want to emphasize again that that doesn't mean that the firm is failing. It just means they're making as much money here as they could if they used those pro uh, if they used all those resources for their next best alternative uses. All right, so that is fisheries and how they kind of relate to our profit maximization stuff that we talked about in chapter three. All right now that's it for this particular lecture video. Our uh, second lecture video for chapter uh, seven here is going to focus on timber stands as another form of renewable resource and how to properly engage in forest management. And that's going to be an important chapter in case you ever own your own t uh, timber stand one day. Uh, you might be able to decide how to best use it or cut it in order to maximize your profits both now and in the future. So we're going to talk about that when we come back in uh, the second lecture video here for chapter seven. But for now, just let me know if you have any questions about those fishery graphs. Again, don't get too hung up on the mechanics of the graph. Just be able to answer some simple questions about the different points on those graphs, and you should be good to go. But again, I'm not going to ask you to draw them for the exam. So just let me know if you have any questions. You can shoot me that email or come visit me in the Zoom office hours, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I look forward to talking to you all next time for uh, uh, the second part here of Chapter 7. But until then, uh, let me know if you need anything and take care.